So I have uh, so I have lecture notes to talk about a handful of different papers about firms and profit maximization and pricing. Um, but I thought before I do that, or instead of doing that, I should just ask you if you have any questions you'd like to talk with me and with Jesse about about. Well, anything, like about the profession, <laughs> about the I, I teach a course here at UC that's called Introduction to Empirical Research. And, but mostly I just, mostly I just wax on and on about, like, about kind of the tactics or the strategy of being successful in the profession. And, and it's stuff that I think isn't really communicated enough to grad students about, you know, about the job market and about things that help you and hurt you on the job market or about, um, about you know submitting papers to journals and what are the costs and benefits of when you do that. I mean, so I don't know. I mean, so I want to open it up because I do think that that's actually actually super important, right? That that um that, that graduate students kind of have the idea yeah, about, about marketing your papers. I think a lot of graduate students have the idea that you can write down some you know get some result, not explain it very clearly, post it on your web page. And somehow someone's going to find it, read it, and offer you a job, right? which isn't going to happen, right? So a lot of a lot of what you do in this profession is about how you sell your ideas and how do you make them interesting. So okay, so it's like I, it's a, it's what are you supposed to write in a cover letter when you submit a paper to a journal? I don't. So I was an editor for ten years, and I cannot remember ever reading a cover letter. I just threw those <laughs> in the garbage, and I went out of the paper. So, um, I, I, so what my covers look like? What do my cover letters look like when I send a journal? Is I say, dear, you know, whatever the name of the editor is, uh, enclosed, now you do it electronically, but when I used to do a hard copy, enclosed is, are, you know, three copies of this paper entitled such and such, co authored with, with this person and that person, uh, along with a check for $125. Um, I, you know, uh, I thank you in advance for your time and energy in evaluating the manuscript. No. Yeah, but let's talk about revise and resubmit, because that's actually much more important. That's actually like one of the most important things. And yeah, Jesse's good at this. He can tell me. When you get uh, send a paper to a journal and you get a revise and resubmit, I think there is exactly one correct strategy to follow, and that is to to essentially try to bury the referees and the editor with your response. So basically, you just do, I mean, so start by just doing, you do everything, right? Do whatever they ask, unless it obviously, obviously is wrong or makes the paper worse. And, um, what about if it requires in order to get that? Okay, so that's, yeah, so, so yeah, obviously you don't want to do it in order to work. It depends, it depends which paper it is, whether you want to do it in order. At, at the AAR, the JP, or the QJ, then you probably do it anyway. Um, but unless you can think of a way to, explain why you shouldn't do it, right? You can always try to, to argue with people. But I think that the, the general logic is, I tell you, as an editor, I see it all the time, is someone will send me back 40 pages in responses, right? So for everything, I, you know, I have a list of 12 things I ask them to do, and there will be a two-page response to each of those 12 things, plus like 25 pages with referees that's me. And I have to admit that oftentimes I get like half my term. Whatever, I, I can't be bothered. I'm just going to publish the paper. It's just too much trouble. Um, and so I think in general, that's, uh, you know, with referees, I think you just, um, you just, I mean, the right way, so the right way to respond to a referee report is to cut and paste each comment they make and then to just, you know, put in a task and then put your response. You don't always have to agree with the referee, but in general, uh, the more you do, probably the better. So, you know, mostly referees are pretty good, but sometimes they just totally miss the boat. And sometimes editors are paying enough attention and with it enough to know that they've totally missed the boat, but sometimes they're right. The way I think about it conceptually is like when you're submitting the paper for the first time, you don't know who the exactly who the audience is. I mean, maybe you know the editor is going to be, but you don't know who the referees are going to be. So you've had to write it broadly. So you can't spend 25 pages on one point. Because you don't know the chance that any one person cares about that one point. Even if you know all the points that could possibly be raised, you can't respond to all of them in detail. Yep. After you get that R and R, now you know you're pretty much the audience you mostly care about. And now 
three people or something like that, or four people, whatever. So now you can really specialize your paper. Now you gotta be careful, obviously, in terms of you know keeping account of the fact that there's another stage there where you're gonna hopefully have other people read it. Right. How many people really read papers when they're published now anyway? I think you're right, yeah. so really you're trying to get certified. And, and at that point <laughs> everybody you care about everybody you, ca everybody you care about's already read it. The rest is just certification. And so now you know that the three people who are four people who matter for certifying it, you know what they care about, and you just want to kind of annihilate those concerns. Right. Sometimes you can do it better. One time at the QJA, by accident, when they sent me back the referee reports, they also sent me the communication between the editors where they listed off the explicit names of each of the referees, which is really helpful. I'm like, God, I never would have guessed that referee report was by this guy. Now I know exactly what papers to cite. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes uh, you can do even better. The more you know about it, the better. So anyway, Emily, I just, I just offered to answer questions about the profession. Uh, before I got going, I'm talking about the people I know. Yeah, so this correspondence, so once you receive this uh, like report, do you make this 25-page report and say it by itself, send it as an email to your referees, or? No, so you, just, you will send it back to the editor. So the editor will say, the editor will send you a letter, and, and I'd say whenever you're in doubt about whether a letter is a revised resubmit or a rejection, I just resubmit it anyway. Because again, <laughs> same thing, as an editor, if, if you're kind of on the fence and then a guy sends a paper back to you, then you end up saying, well, okay, fine, I'll just send it out. And you end up just, the path of least resistance is often just to, um, so I've a number of times had papers rejected from journals in ways that, I, you know, I would, I would just send the paper back and say, look, you rejected this paper, but the, the comments I got from the referees and from you were so insightful that I've changed it, so uh, maybe you'll like it better. And then usually what they'll do is they'll send it back out to the referees, and sometimes the referees will select it. Um, so yeah, you'll just send the whole packet directly back to the editor, to the journalist. And you would, because you wouldn't know how to send it to the referees, because all the referees are anonymous. So this is um, a separate question, and it kind of relates to my own research. Um, basically, I've been in Ottawa for the past year using confidential data at Statistics Canada. Um, however, I do realize that it reduces my face time with my department, and also, if I do end up in the revise and resubmit stage, I will have to go back to Ottawa to do the empirical work. As a young researcher, do you think that it's worth it to make a commitment like this, or is it better to try to use data that does not require me to live in another right. place? It's, it's a trade-off. I, I, I am all in favor of finding new and different data as an avenue towards success. Right? If you think about the things that you can do in a profession that will make your research useful, right? One is you can have new ideas. <coughs> and new ideas are hard. It's hard to come up with new ideas, especially if you go to the, the problems people think about that. Uh, you can, you know, new data sets are, are a good way to approach it, right? Asking, asking new questions, right? So, so it's kind of separate from my piece. You can just go ask questions. Right? A lot of what I've done, which is a lot easier, like a lot of what Kevin has done. Like Kevin has basically, done, I would say, Kevin, you've defined your career by taking like the hardest, most well, traffic problems around and like doing it better, right? So there's a lot of the stuff but you know what you and Katz did and a little bit a lot of what you and Gary you and Gary kind of break also ask new questions, but but a lot of what you aren't afraid to do because you you have the skills to stick to stay whatever economic problems out there, I'm just gonna go solve it the right way. Okay, but for people like me, it's like I can't do that, right? I can't go and say, oh well, Katz and Burpee were all screwed up. Let me go fix what they did, right? I gotta go find some problems that no one else is thinking about because that's where I think Kind of being a little bit creative helps you, but you don't have to. You don't have to be incredibly technical if you do that. You don't have to, um, you know, be incredibly good at, at, at necessarily manipulating what Kevin has on the board. You can go find some. Okay. But data is, uh, I mean, the value of new data, I think, cannot be underestimated. I mean, I said before that the most valuable 15 minutes of your graduate career is probably sitting around and thinking of every person you know who might have access to a good data set. And, and then go on and figure out if you can get that data. Okay? Now, yours comes with a lot of costs. Right? And the costs aren't just that you've got to be in auto, it's the costs are that you know, it's, it's incredibly time consuming, right? Because you've got to go through all the rigmarole of people. Okay, but no one else is using it, right? So that's what's good about it. Um, and so, so I, I think there, it, obviously we can't answer you definitively that question, but, but I think it's pretty clear the costs and benefits, and there are a lot of benefits okay. to what you're doing. 
I think this business about FaceTime with your department is probably, if you're thinking about like your advisors, uh -huh. I assume not like your your friends, but if you're just right. thinking about like, is it is it costly to not be around my advisor? And I haven't been to seminars, you know. I think that's not really right. I think that, that in the end, like of course, all else equal, if you were just hanging out at, where do you go to school? Princeton. If you were just hanging out at Princeton and like not going to seminars because like you were lazy or were napping or something, that probably isn't a good idea. Uh -huh. But if you're like doing something that is actually going to produce a much better job market paper at the end of the day, you're just going to look at your job market paper and see whether they like it and that's okay. the most important. Almost every advisor would say the less they see you, the better. Right? <laughs> right? So the best. What's, what's the best world? Like the best world of all is where you come with completely complete. Like you come with a paper. You come with a job mark paper that's perfect and done. You've never talked to your advisor. You hand it to them. They read it and say, "Perfect. That's exactly what I've done." Right? Every advisor would love to have students who do that. Right? And there's nothing worse than people who come back over and over every two months with the same paper. Exact same paper I got two months ago. What am I supposed to say other than you didn't do anything I said two months ago? So, um, obviously, the idea is that advisors add value, right? So you want to be around them because they're going to improve the product. But in a perfect world, I think, I think one of the things you struggle with as a graduate student is that advisors, if you try and divvy up the, the credit for a paper at the end of the day, okay, you got a couple co authors, you got advisors, you got referees. Uh, you got a journal editor, you have your friends. Okay, if you had to go around everyone at the end of the day and say, what share of the value of this paper did I generate? The, the, the shares would add up to two or three hundred percent, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's true of almost anything that gets made. Everybody thinks, I think there are reasons, there are good economic reasons why that happens too. It's not just chance that it happens. Uh, same way if you ask everybody if they're good drivers. Right? If you ask people if they're above average drivers, everybody's an above average driver. Partly that's just because people are maybe uh, are optimistic, but it's because people define driving differently, right? So I, I get in a lot of crashes, so I don't want to define a good driver as someone who gets a lot of crashes. Like, I define it as someone who can drive fast and not be scared, right? <laughs> 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 right? You know, so I think that's, so in that sense, I think the more, my own view is the more as a graduate student you can produce your own work without involving a bunch of other people, at the end of the day, Right, so if you come if you come with a raw idea, one of my students comes with a raw idea to me, and I improve on that idea, to the end of time, I'm convinced that 100 percent of the credit for that paper, minus like four percent of the execution, come goes to me. Right, but if you hand me a paper that's already done, there's no way in the world that I'm taking the credit for it. I think that's uh, uh, something to think about as you as you see some situation. Right, any other questions? Yeah. You um, talked a fair bit about techniques, and can you reflect a little on, I'm sure you have a number of different ideas at different times, like how do you, how do you decide whether an idea is interesting or not or, or worth working on now? Uh, yeah, so, what, so let's, go, let's go back here one step further, let's talk about ideas. I think that in general there's way too little time spent on idea generation. Right? That I would I would say that all of you would uh, should uh, have a book, and every time you get an idea, you should just write it in that book. Okay? And one of the things that people who are into idea generation, like these guys at IDEO or IDEO, whatever they call it, out is out there who's kind of done idea generation, made it into an art form, is they say you should never try to you never judge an idea right away because okay? you. Either overestimate how great the idea is or, or dismiss it too quickly. Just put it in the book and go back. Um, you need essentially one idea to be successful in our profession. Right? You have one good idea over your graduate career and you execute that as a paper, you get a good job. You need maybe one more good idea to get tenure, but maybe not even depending on, uh, depending on how things go. Um, and so, given that that's true, you would think, unless you think there's just unbelievable diminishing marginal returns to idea generation, People should be spending enormous amounts of time trying to generate ideas. I, I think people don't. I think, I think what happens is people generate one idea, and then they just go work on that for six or eight months. Yeah. See, and thinking about how to do that is a little. Can you just tell about the thing with where you lay on the couch for the summer and then nothing happens? Yeah, I'm talking about that. So, so I had when I was in graduate school, I had written a bunch of little papers, and my advisor Jim Paterba said, "Okay, you, you got four little papers, so what you read." What you need now is you need to write seven more papers. Okay. So I, I, I went home and I remember I visualized, sat on the couch, 
And I would spend about three hours a day trying to come up with several ideas. That's such an entire summer, I didn't have one. Finally, when I realized that I wasn't really a several idea kind of person, that I was not, I, mean, I was trying to think of big ideas about how we were going to revolutionize this or that, and it just didn't work for me. So I had to go back to doing my little stuff, okay? But, so, um, so I think that's important to recognize that, that ideas can be little things, right? Ideas can be, can be small, you know? Uh, and how do you generate ideas? I mean, my own view about idea generation is you just do something different every single day. All right, so when I was in grad school, my, my single best source of ideas came from reading political science journals. Okay? Because they were so bad. Okay? And you just open up, they had some interesting, and you'd read, and, and even as a second year graduate, I would read this paper and say, I cannot believe that the top political science journal published this paper. It's so obviously, uh, is like reverse causality. And I can think of an instrument right now, and, and it'll take me three weeks to write the paper. Okay? So that's how I used to get a lot of ideas. Okay? But what else do you do? Just go to, I, I would just go into, and I got interested in crime. And I would just go into the stacks of the library, and I'd pull up a chair, and I'd sit in the crime section, and I would just pull out different books, uh, data books, or books that, you know, 18th, 19th century criminology submitted, or whatever, and I'd just look for something that caught my attention. I mean, you don't need a, again, you don't need a very high return, right? You need one idea, so if, yeah, I, what else would I do? Um, one thing I definitely did for about two years, um, once I figured out, it took me a long time to figure out how instrumental variables work. Okay, to like actually get some intuition for what was an instrumental variable. And after I finally figured it out, for two years I walked around and every single thing I looked at, I said, is that an instrument for anything? Okay. <laughs> now when I got on the subway, I'd be looking, I'd be looking at some ad and I'd say, could that ad, is there anything in that ad that could be an instrument for anything? And then I'd walk I'd, you know, everywhere. And the thing is, when you do that, you find some instruments. Not very often, but like two or three times a year, you find an instrument, and that's that's a lot. I mean, that's a that's a lot. That's a lot. That's more paper than most people write. So I think that there are an infinite variety of ways you can generate ideas, um, and uh, you know, and, and 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 people underinvest. So I don't know. Do you three agree that people underinvest in, in the pursuit of ideas relative to uh, the execution of whatever idea you had last? Yeah, I think I think they don't take advantage of, like you said, the things that just strike you and hit you. They get a lot of ideas. Maybe you're just reading the newspaper or something that happens in the newspaper. You're always thinking like an economist, just thinking about, well, is that right? How would you show that? You know, why is why would what would economics say about this situation? I mean, it just, there, there's, there's just ideas will come to you yes. as you, but you have to be kind of running them through that filter. I mean, you gotta, you got all this information that's coming in through you, to you. You're just gonna make sure you pass it through that kind of idea filter, you know? Right. I mean, as opposed to just kind of, like you said, other people are sitting on the train looking at that ad and they're going, oh, you know, whoa, what's that? You know? <laughs> 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 Right? Anyway, it didn't take the, any more effort right. to think really about what was an instrument. It probably was more fun than just looking at that. Right, because that was kind of my definition at that time. That's how I defined economics, but I defined it in terms of, of two sixty squares. squares. Yeah. yeah. So now I have it, you know, so, I, so let's talk about what makes an idea interesting. Yeah, I think the, the only thing I would say there is I think both of these examples are, are illustrate why, like, sitting on your couch and trying to think of ideas is probably not, for most people, is not going to be a great way to come up with ideas, like especially if you're going to do empirical work, you know, having your yourself open to the idea as you do other things is the is the key. That that it's not that you're going to sit there mostly and just like be like, okay, I have an idea. Okay, like I have my two hours today of idea time. Like whatever, that's not going to work for most people. But you know, having thinking about things as you read or as you, you know, like in the car this morning, Jesse was like, okay, I'm reading the Economist. I have three ideas. You know, I have three topics for you. You should be working on it. But I like listening. I've it. And so, you know, that, that's an example. Household production. <laughs> <laughs> I read The Economist and tell them what articles to worry about. So, anyway. Uh, yeah, what should I do? Something you said really triggered a thought. I'm sorry, I can remember it now. Um, uh, I can't remember. It'll come back to me. Uh, so, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, how you know whether. Oh, what you going to say? I think, at least for me, one thing that is not a good source of ideas is reading economic papers. 
I mean, other people might be different, but I think, I think what you tend to do if you read economics papers is you tend to think exactly like the author of that paper did and think, how can I add some bell or some whistle to what you're doing? And if you're a macroeconomist, that's perfect, because that's more or less how success in macroeconomics is defined. It's taking the existing set of models and making them more complicated. But I think as a microeconomist, that's not, um, that's, at least for me, it's not the way that, that I uh, have really ever found um, good examples. Okay. Let's talk about what, how you know if an idea is interesting or good, or not interesting. Whether an idea is good. Okay, I think the first thing, one thing is interesting. Right? That there's some ideas that are just intrinsically interesting and they're interesting to you, especially interesting to you is important, but interesting to other people is useful as well. Um, another, another thing I think that makes it a, a subject or an idea for a paper good is when, uh, is when the current conventional wisdom is left in wrong. Right? So, so when you can change people's priors. Right? So you want to be able to change the way people think about something. A third aspect is that there's actually economic content. Right? So a lot of um, a lot of my own papers don't have a lot of economic content. Right? They just they're like statistical. They're they're, they're not about markets. They're not about um, things that economists are interested in. And that's I mean and the thing is I'm going to list off a whole set of things that make a paper good or interesting. You're not going to have every one every time, but but more and more I've found over the last five or six years is that if I don't feel like a paper's got good economic content, I just won't. Even if I think it could be a paper, I just won't do it. That, that, I, that, that um, I have a scarcity of time, I have an excess of ideas, and, and I want to think of myself as an economist, and so I want, I want to try to make it feel most like an economist. Um, I think, in general, in general, it's, it's better to to write about things that are that are more novel. I think I think that it's whether it's subject matter, whether it's data sets, whether it's um, uh, research approaches. I think in general, if you can do something new and different, it's it's, it's hard. Even if you, if you even if you add insight, if you're the seventeenth person. It's very difficult to, uh, to make, make a difference. If you look at the young people, and I think uh, one, one general rule is look at the young people who are being successful in the profession. And what are they doing? Right, that's why I would highly recommend that you go to the job market talks and people who come to university. What are the best people in the job market this year working on? What is it about the way they're doing it that's getting them giving them jobs? I think if you look at the young people who are being successful, it's been true for about the last, basically my core and beyond, the young people being successful have been expanding the boundaries of economics. Um, so whether it's like Caroline Hoxby doing education or Ed Glazer doing urban or me studying crime or political economy or um, you know, Jesse doing media and, and Emily doing stuff on, you know, on AIDS and, and you know, sort of different sort of health economics on people with uh, it's just, it's just you kind of get a sense of what of, of where the rewards are. I think a lot of the rewards really go back to kind of the path that Becker carved out in the 50s and 60s. Where Gary said you can apply economics to anything, okay? and it's taken a long. There's a lot of things to apply to. There's still a lot of stuff out there that people haven't thought very much about economically. And I think there's the, the rents come to people who can, who can figure out what's interesting but still. Open. Yeah, it's a little bit different. I know that a very student, so there is some kind of uh, data scared. So a lot of people think that you know, even if you have a good idea, but a lot of you need to get data in order to go through your research. And if it's very difficult, uh, if it's close, or if it's not possible, you will waste your time. So so many people first try to find data and then ask some questions. Yeah, I think that's I think that's tricky. I, I think very rarely. Do you find data, at least for me, very rarely do I find data and then think of interesting questions. Um, not unheard of, but in general, I like to have an idea and go try and find the data. And what I've found, I mean, partly I'm a unique case, right? People are more willing to give me data than they probably are willing to give Ashley data just because, you know, you know, they know who I am and, and I promise to write about them in future books. <laughs> so that goes a long way. But I've found that people, 
people love to give you data because everybody loves to feel important. And by asking people for data, no one ever wants their data. And even when there's not much good that can ever come of them, like when, when I went to the ACLU and said, I'd like to get your data on prison overcrowding, I mean, if they had thought about it for a while, <laughs> they would have realized that nothing good was ever going to come to, uh, to the ACLU from giving me the data. Another time I was trying to get um, find cheating and dog racing. And uh, I went to the people who, who kept the, the betting pool. And I said, well, I wanted their data. And the guy was some programmer. He like, worked really, really hard. He wanted to give me the data. Now, eventually, I get, it all fell apart. I didn't get the data. But here's the guy. They, his company had everything to lose and nothing to gain from giving me, me the data. But he personally, as a principal agent company, he personally felt like this is somebody who wants to give me their data. I mean, we, we go to companies all the time, and they're willing to do a lot of work to give us data just because it feels good to have somebody think that. Uh, I'll give you an example. So um, one of my undergrads this year got interested in Zappos, the shoe company. And so he just called them on the phone and said, you know, would you be willing to give me your data? And they said, well, what kind of data do you want? He said, I want all the information on every transaction you've ever done. They said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they did. They gave him, like, you know, whatever. They, they sell 10% of the shoes in America. They gave him depersonalized information, but on every transaction. So he, he can follow. He knows, you know. And then they went further and, and actually gave him from the call center. Every time somebody called, they were willing to link up each of these orders to each of the calls. I mean, they just did it because they were in. You know, they thought maybe they'd learn something. So you should never know when, when you go out and find data what, what good will come from. Yes? Um, you I mean, it, in the job market, I like brown receivers, but I know that in the job market talks, I'm also pretty sure what guys are going to come in and raise questions that you're interested in. So, does it mean that you have to, I mean, Market talk in a different way, or you, your motivation has to be changed? So, it's a good question, hard question. So, would I change the content of my job market paper to, uh, I guess I wouldn't, you want to write the best paper you can, and, and, it, and I wouldn't worry about it. the seminars, so the so seminars are totally different. At right? the seminar, you've got to convince a bunch of people who, who don't really understand probably can never understand your theory, convince them that you're useful. I mean, some of the most, I, I say for econometricians, the best econometrics job talks are ones where they spend the first hour explaining the state of the art in econometrics, and then like 15 minutes on their stuff, because people get kind of confused about what their contribution is and what the in the profession. And no one's that interested in like the cutting edge of econometrics, right? So you can go a long way away from the cutting edge and kind of build it up. And, uh, and do that. I think the same is a little bit true in theory, right? That, that you can kind of walk people through a long ways of, um, of uh, kind of what's, you know, what the problem is and how other people try to solve the problems, though. That will be interesting, right? It's all about people who think about who their audience is and whether it's going to be interesting. But I think the other thing, so we had um, a couple of years ago in the job market, we had two people who were doing very, both very, very smart guys doing very similar, in many ways, very similar papers where they were axiomatizing utility functions, which explained the Ellsberg paradox. We had, like, within a week, we had two guys who were doing exactly the same thing with excellent papers that, I guess, the axioms all worked out. And this is something I obviously know nothing about, right? So I had office meetings with both of these guys. And, and one of them was fine, but I came away knowing nothing about anything, what he was doing. And the other guy had this, like, you know, sort of per, kind of prepared thing for people like me that was like, this is how I'm doing it. It had three circles. I don't now remember uh, what the circles involved. Um, but at the time, I remember thinking, he was like, you know, this is the circle other people have been in, and this is the circle this other group is in, and here I am in this circle, and this circle is like these other two parts of these other two circles, but it has this other extra stuff. And I thought, wow, that seems really smart. You know, and so, and, and you know, second guy, I think the second guy got a job offer, the first guy didn't. It didn't really mean that the first guy wasn't. He's actually very smart, but. In the end, I think that, that appealing, for someone with a paper that's that complicated, appealing to, to having some way to try to make it clear to the people who are not going to get the details, like yeah, where, where your paper is in the literature, what the contribution, what the basic point is, um, I think is really important. And also trying to make other people feel like they're smart, that's, like, that's important for everybody. And that's like the key thing on the job market, <coughs> making other people feel like they are smart. That is what you want. 
if you leave their office and they think, I am so smart, then that's great. That, then that, that's like huge for you. If they think you're smart, that's also nice. But having them think that they're smart is really the key. Yeah, and that's just smart, but also that you'd be fun to have lunch with. Because uh, I mean, a lot of that, like how do I judge the junior macro people? This is some guy who, if, if I have to sit next to him at the fact of lunch, I'm just someone who I'm gonna, you know, gonna agonize over or am I gonna be happy that it didn't happen. So, so I think that's, uh, What's that? No, I just say it's just funny how cynical everything is. <laughs> so, that's true. Though. I mean, I mean, you have to communicate with people, right? That's really what it comes down to. You know, there's a bit of a dangerous strategy here, though, because you, know, you got the people who aren't really in your field. They don't really understand what you're doing. So you either got to just like avoid them, just, or you got to have the simple story that they understand. The worst, worst. worst Seminars are the cases where you have a half-assed way of explaining it to them, and then you get into this argument with just them. Upsets the, it yeah, just, just upsets them. It just upsets them. Makes you think you don't know what you're talking about. So you either, I mean, I, I think there's kind of a, you know, the middle road is the bad road in this world. You know, you go left or right. The people who are going to decide about you are the theorists. If you're a theorist, and so you know, it's probably better to have your job talk be appealing. You have to appeal to them, but the, the way to deal with the other people, I think you have to, if you're going to try to explain it to them, you have to have, uh, you have to, you have to do a good job. You have to think about it in advance, because you're going to get yourself in trouble. I mean, you've seen a lot of seminars get derailed, where somebody's really off on something that they didn't even need to get into, and, you know, and those seminars don't go well. Like, as an example, if you're an empirical person, and you put a model, a formal model in your paper because somebody tells you you can't get a job with a formal model, and then your model's not internally consistent, <laughs> that's clearly worse than not having a model at all. I mean, that's just, it's like a killer. Like, didn't you just yes, done? Exactly, that's, that's an example of a middle that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a case where if that happens and it's 20 minutes in your seminar, the best thing to do is just say, okay, fine, let's just close it up. <laughs> I mean, everyone would like you better. Put the paper back it up in the suitcase. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to say, and, you know, I'm going to uh, I'm I'm, I'm to fix this before my next talk, right? But, uh, but, uh, um, yeah. I have to go because I need some more time. <laughs> um, let me say one thing. I, I, I might not like. I, I, the first two talks I gave kind of were about um, different approaches in economics, and, and I kind of came down on one side or the other. But I do want to make clear there. There are infinite numbers of ways to succeed in this profession. And people have different talents and different skills. It's a huge profession. And if I say the, the one or two things that are most important to success, above everything else, uh, the first one I would just say is hard work. Right? If I look at the, the young people who, the, people, the, the thing that makes you most likely to get tenure in a good department it is working incredibly hard. Right? But I think the key to working incredibly hard is tricking yourself into thinking that you like doing economics. I think that, that, that basically the people who most succeed in this profession are the ones who never consider this a job, but like can't think of what else to do if they're not working, right? And that it like drives them crazy if they've got to be home with their kids because they'd rather be at work trying to figure out the answer to some, some problem. And it's like maybe not necessarily the, the best thing in terms of utility, but in terms of getting tenure, is you can clearly see the people who who, who love what they do, right? So, so what do you say? So maybe you don't love what you do. So there are two things you got. There's two two things you can do. One is either you can figure I just don't love what I do. Let me go do something else right now rather than draw this out uh, longer and be unsuccessful. In it. Or you gotta you gotta find the part of the economics that you love. Right? I do not love most of the economics. Right? I'm not that interested in most of the stuff that I see, but but I like the stuff that I do. The stuff that I do, I'm intrinsically interested. I try to pick topics that will make me want to stay up late at night working on it. And I think, I think a lot of people pick topics because their advisor works on it, because they think somebody thinks that would be a good idea. But try to find stuff that you really love, and that's, that will, that's what will, you know, that's what will get you up, you know, that's what will get you out of bed at two in the morning when suddenly you realize maybe you could, you could solve something that you couldn't solve the day before. And that's that's people you like work. That's true too, co-authors. The co-authors. They kind of keep you going when you kind of run out of gas or whatever. You know. Yeah, it's a lot more fun. <coughs> I, 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 so I have a fantasy baseball. I had a fantasy baseball team. I do a fantasy baseball team. 
And the first year I did it alone, and I realized there's nothing anybody else in the world cares less about than your fantasy baseball game. You can not convince your wife, your mother, anybody to listen for more than about 30 seconds a year to how your fantasy baseball game is. So then I got a friend, and I did fantasy baseball with him. Now we both have ownership of it, we want to talk about it. Okay, and it's like, we call him, it's the only reason I talk with one of my best friends for college, because we have fantasy baseball. It's the same with co-op, right? It's like, nobody wants to hear about like you can't, this piece of code isn't working in this aggression or something like that, except your co-author. And so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of value to finding, to, to finding co-authors who both complement you with different sets of skills and, and also that you, that make it fun. That, that, uh, it's a lot of about fun. I mean, I think that's what, this should be fun. Right? We picked a profession that doesn't pay all that well, uh, that doesn't have all of that much stats, whatever, but it's, but it, at least it's got to be fun. And a lot of people who do it have fun doing it. And if you don't have fun doing it, you just have a huge comparative disadvantage. Huge comparative disadvantage. Jesse? I just wanted to add a few things to the earlier points yeah. about data. Yeah. That's all right. I Please. Just, I guess I have a few. I mean, I, I'm not in as much of a position as these guys are to be given advice, but I have a few thoughts on that that I've sort of noticed as I've gone through. And some of them are about taste, I think. And, some probably are more about technology, but I think I think one thing that I think is I think you know insight is complementary with good data. It's not really a substitute. It is what I've noticed. So you know, like it relates a little bit to what we're talking about, but you know you can have a richer model with more parameters and more going on if you have more data with which to identify it. So having really good data that's really well suited to your problem lets you show off the fact that you can understand your problem more deeply. If you have really lousy data, the best you can hope to do is squeeze out a mean or something like that. You can't really do much analysis. But better data become more amount with more experiments inside them or more richness, better accuracy, you know, more stuff going on, gives you more of an opportunity to show that you can think through a lot of different elements of a problem. So that's kind of one thing that I've noticed, both from the point of view of producing actual knowledge about the world and from the point of view of showing what you can do is it's really nice to have data that's well suited, because then you can really go to that next step that literature couldn't take because the data wouldn't support it. Mm -hmm. Previous people who've come before you and used lousy data, you know, noisy survey data or something like that, have tried to take that next step and the, the data just explodes. So they can't, you can't distinguish for those people whether it's because they weren't smart enough or the data weren't good enough. You can, you know, show that, that you're able to think through a deeper level of the problem by taking the administrative data set or whatever it is and, and uh, you know, adding that next layer of analysis. So that's, that's one thing that I think I've noticed. And then I guess the other, I had two, like two other thoughts about that. One is, um, I, my experience with, with this question of do you have the data before the question or the question before the data has been a little bit different than either of those extremes. My experience in a lot of cases has been, I have several good questions that I think the data will be well suited for and usually will turn out that it's not perfect for any of those, but there's something slightly different that it actually takes you towards. So I find like, you go into the data and you realize it's rich in a way you didn't expect and not so rich in the ways you thought. But usually having no ideas going into getting a data set, I find it's useful. Yeah. I mean, that's been my experience. Yeah. So I usually get, like if I'm gonna invest a lot in getting a data set, I usually think, boy, there's like five or six things I might be able to do with this that all have some upside. And usually I find there's two or three things I can do that are different from those first five or six things. So I think, you know, in some sense I'm a little bit in between on that in that, you know, I feel like it, it doesn't usually work out to just blindly go get some data. But you know, it's also not the case that it's always, you're always going to have the perfect plan for what's going to happen because the world, that's the whole point of getting the data. You don't know what's in there. If you already knew, you would have the data. So what would be the point of getting it, I guess? You know? I mean, you have a prior, maybe you have a different view than other people, so you're taking a bet. But at some level, you're getting the data to learn something, and you usually do. And then my one other thing is, you know, because ideas are so important and hard to create, you know, when you when you combine related to my first point, when you combine like a good idea with bad data, you kind of like blown like a bullet. Like you, you don't have that many bullets to spend in your life, and you just kind of like fired a, fired a blank basically. And so I, you know, I haven't been doing this that long, obviously, but I've had things where like Kevin told me some idea. We were just talking about something like that. Kevin right. told me so he doesn't even know about this, but he yeah. told me some idea like five years ago, and I just sat on it because I didn't have a way to answer it. And then data showed up a few months ago that are really well suited to answering that question. I mean, we'll, you know, who knows where that will go. But that kind of thing, you know, it's, it's, I think it's worth waiting for the data that really are suited to that problem. 
and not to sort of spend that idea and go get some lousy data and make a hash of it. Because you won't really be able to implement it. It won't work out well. That's, I don't know, those are my thoughts on data. Great. All right, let's take one more question. Um, given that we often go to conferences with papers that are still works in progress, um, how do you deal with requests for papers, particularly from the policy community, because they just want that number? Well, I, I try to not present my papers in public until I think until I think they're actually pretty good. I mean, I sometimes, like I told you a story yesterday about how sometimes you don't know when your own papers are bad. This story about you have. I don't want your paper. Though. <laughs> it was like, you remember the remember when I gave the seminar on uh, the school choice paper, and like in the first minute you said like it seems like you like totally missed the point, yes. and I said, no, no, actually, and I explained. Well, anyway, we had missed the point up until about two weeks before. We didn't have time to change the paper, but we had figured it out, exactly. and then we were able. And then one of my best seminars ever because every time, every time we came to another point where it looked like we missed a point, you said. See, this is where I thought you would miss a point. I said, yes, we didn't miss a point. It didn't work out great. But, um, but, uh, but in general, I think, I think you want to, I'm not a big proponent of going out with papers and presenting them, you know, without having tried to think through everything. So by the time I'm presenting a paper, pretty much my view is if somebody wants, somebody wants it for anything, they should use it for anything. You know, subject to me not finding out in that seminar that I did something horribly wrong with it, but, uh, which doesn't happen, you know, shouldn't happen very often. Um, so, I don't know, I think that's good. If you're writing papers that people want the answer to, that's a really good sign. Um, and, uh, but they'll still want the answers to the papers. I think we're telling them later. Wait till yeah, you get the answer. I'm happy to send you the work paper version when I have it. Thank okay. you very much for your interest. I think that's a good idea. That's Otherwise, you end up, if you, if your results change, and it's just, it just can be a yeah. mess. But I, but I, but so yeah, I agree with that. But I also want to hit a study. You just shouldn't be. I just, you really shouldn't be off giving papers in workshops okay. if you think there's a decent chance the results are going to change between. You know, sometimes people tell you smart stuff and then your results change. But, but it's a, it's a goal. I know what your friends are for. But your friends are for figuring out, like talking to them, you know, in private about here's what I'm doing. Am I doing something wrong? It's a good smart. To have, it's good to have smart friends, right? So. But like pretty much every paper I have, if I can, I'll find Kevin. How run it by Kevin? I feel like if Kevin can't tell me that's horribly wrong with that, I'm in pretty good shape for uh, for taking it out on the road. Okay, one thing I never like to do though is to have the first seminar I give be in, in Gary's seminar here, where you've got all of the best people in Chicago. Uh, it's a place probably the, the single place you are most likely to be humiliated as an economist if you go to the paper. And so I never like to go there first. I like to go other places and see whether um, you know whether the you know the the minor league, the, the triple A team can humiliate me before I go and try with them. <laughs> well, the other thing is, uh, I know I think is a lot of times your papers will get better after you go to the conference, but just give a more limited paper at the first conference. And then what's going to happen after you get the feedback from the seminar of the conference is you're going to write a broader paper than you wrote the first. You're going to ask the second question that you should have asked the first time. Well, you want to walk in there with the first question done correctly. I mean, I, you don't necessarily have to have done the second question. You don't want to walk in there with the first question done badly. And it's hard to think of a paper that you have that I haven't done where it changed a lot from the first time we gave it to the last time we did it. And not because we undid so much what we did the first time, it's just we figured out the next layer to go to after the first time. And I think that's usually what happens if you, if you do a good job the first time. Because then the seminar is going to focus, well, that's a great result. What else can you do with it? As opposed to the seminar is going to focus on why your results so screwed up. I mean, it's, you're actually getting less value. So you're using them to debug your code, but they're not giving you the other half of the project. And often it's the second half of the project that makes it more interesting. Of course, Andre Schleifer has the opposite strategy. Andre wants to come here and have something half-baked. And, and have, I don't know. So there's, there, there's a difference of opinion. Right? Because Andre will tell you that. He says, I love to come to Chicago, give my seminar, and then I go back and completely rewrite the paper. Isn't that? It's Andre's strategy. It's a different. See, I, I don't like that strategy. You do if you've got Clark Metal, then if you don't yeah. have Clark Metal, yes. because yes. people make a little less. Uh, they have judgments about your talent. If you, uh, people are rough on Andre here, though. They're 
not, it's not that they're well, not. It's not that they're not. No, it's not that they're not. Steve's not saying they pull punches, they just don't infer. Yeah, we don't. We invite them back. They have an opinion we about them already. We're not going to be bad. Okay. I really like to do in the first one. You prefer a more limited paper and then you get a broader scope for your paper. All right, so let's talk about some, so I wanted to talk about papers on, on pricing, crop maximization, things like that. Let's, let me start by saying, how many, how many papers can you name, or not how many, how many papers do you think there are that are written about uh, utility maximization? Like how many, how many zeros would you put on the end of the number of papers, empirical, empirically oriented papers, trying to test some kind of aspect of utility maximization? A lot, right? I don't know, like thousands of papers. Like every you know, reverses of you know revealed preference and basically a uh, ton of papers. Okay, how about profit maximization? Can anyone name a paper that tries to test whether firms profit maximize? There's a bunch of papers. Like which one? All these guys who estimate these cost functions and then do some tests of whether and equations are consistent with the cost function estimates. There's a, there's a whole, there's a literature people do that. Yeah, like, what well, do you know about like Ollie Biggs or something like that? Well, well, there's, 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 there's people who do like translog cost functions and then they got some prop, people do it in public utilities. There's some yeah. literature in public utilities and things like that. That's the, probably more cost minimization than profit. Yeah. But same, same, like cost minimization. Cost minimization, minimization kind of like. Right. So there are hand, okay, so what what people are always missing though is marginal cost, right? That's what the problem is people have marginal cost, so it's hard to think about. So they, they <laughs> think that's why people do cost minimization. Exactly, <laughs> right, yeah. So, the, um, so if you look at like the number of papers that actually, so, so why, I can think of like two or three papers that actually go out, claim to have marginal cost, and then try to look at firms and see what the firms Couple of utility papers like all for toxic stuff. There's some like auction papers that kind of have that interpretation to them, mm -hmm. where you sort of have some marginal value, marginal cost kind of notion. Right, being sometimes on the lab as well, as, you know, where sort of people are proxying. There are some IO papers where people will back out costs and then they have some measures, some data on costs they kind of compare the two, which in some sense is also. Can also, I mean, any kind of like any supply and demand system like that where we have like the firm side and the consumer side, and you're kind of over identified in some sense. You can test the profit maximization under the maintained hypotheses of the models. So people do stuff like that. It's, you're right, it's relatively rare. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, what do people do instead? What, what modernized YO does instead is to assume profit maximization. Okay. And then by assuming profit maximization, that sets up a bunch of conditions, uh, which then, with a lot of structure, uh, you can get against it. So, uh, so that's a question I've been interested in a long time. So kind of in Jesse's side, did, for a long time, I've wondered, having worked in firms, I've always thought that, that firms don't do a very good job of profit maximizing in a lot of dimensions. And I was waiting and waiting for years to find some data where I might be able to answer. And then one day this, this guy called me, this brachial guy called me, and he said uh, that uh, he was a MIT trained economist. Uh, he had never, he didn't tell me then, but it turned out he never got his PhD, but he had published in the JP a long time ago. And, uh, but he had gone to work in the private sector as an economist for 20 years, and then he dropped out because uh, he didn't like economics. And he started a business where he would bring bagels and donuts. He would, he would buy bagels and donuts wholesale, and he would um, bring them to office parks around Washington, D.C. with a lockbox and a set of poster prices. He'd leave the bagels and donuts in the lockbox <coughs> there in the morning, and he'd come back in the afternoon and he'd see how many bagels and donuts were in there, how much money was in the lockbox. And luckily for me, what he did is every, he did a lot of these deliveries, about 80,000 deliveries. And on every one, he counted up down to the penny uh, how, how much money was in the lockbox. And he put a, 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 a row in an Excel spreadsheet that said for that day and that company, how many bagels he had delivered, how many were left, how many donuts he had delivered, how many were uneaten, and then exactly. And he said, I've offered this data, this data to about 10 different economists, but nobody was interested. But I've read about you, and it seems like you might be the kind of guy who would like to I said, great, send it along. Okay? And so I ended up, you know, so I ended up writing two papers. One was about, about the honesty side of it, about you know, 
what factors influenced how much money went in the lockbox. But the much more interesting paper to me was the question, could I test profit maximization? And the beauty of this model, of this setting, is that it's the simplest business you will ever find, right? It's like essentially one guy, and do you know his marginal cost? Well, once he's already delivering a big box of donuts to some office park, the marginal cost of putting one more in the box is the wholesale cost of the donor, right? So, so you really think you know the, the marginal cost this guy faces uh, among his current customers. And you have the data day by day by day to, to see what's going on. Okay? And, so, uh, and so instantaneously, because I had been wandering around for the last five years wondering how I could solve this problem, when he described his data to me, uh, I had just thought I could answer, I could find the answer question I couldn't, couldn't answer. Now, uh, it's kind of a, so, you know, but look, it's kind of stupid too, right? Because nobody cares about this, this one guy who drops off the air with donuts. And that's a real trail. Like, you talk about it as a paper interesting or not. And this is one of the cases where you got to kind of weigh it. Well, there's something about this which I think is interesting, which is very hard to compelling to test profit maximization. And there's something very uninteresting about this paper because it's not an, it, it, it may not be very generalizable. Uh, it's, it's not an interesting application, but I think one of the things that I like about it is when you talk to this guy and you ask him if he knows the inverse elasticity rule for pricing, he says he does, and he can tell you what it is, right? So here's a guy who actually has all the tools to do, he knows what he's supposed to be setting equal to what when he maximizes. And the question of is he, is he able to do it in, in practice? Okay. So let's just, so I mean the beauty of this project is that it is so easy. Right, that the profit maximization problem he has is so incredibly easy. Okay. Until I went home and sat down on the couch and tried to solve it. Okay. It turns out it's a really unbelievably hard problem. Okay, because it's not our typical problem where um, there's a market. It's really an inventory problem because he drops those bagels off. And so he's got to like, so, so one thing, he only changes prices four times in 15 years. Okay. But, but the thing is, his real problem is He's, I think you think about it, he takes prices fixed, and every day he tries to figure out how many bagels and donuts to bring to each customer. Okay. So you got two, you got two goods, you got bagels and you got donuts. Presumably they're substitutes for one another. And it's really about stock out problem. That's the thing. So uh, how many does he want to bring? So when you start thinking about how you're going to model this, right, you got what do you need to know? What's the key thing you need to know? And there are a couple things, but yeah, Joseph? This is a question, not just directly an answer. But suppose IO economists think people are profit maximizing plus a random optimization error. And so you find in this business you miss the maximum with an error. What do you take from it about other businesses that may be normally distributed around the maximum? Yeah, so it, so it depends what you mean. You mean so on a given day he misses or you mean kind of systematically so over his life? Yeah, so how are you going to generalize this is all other question. I'm not sure what you what exact we're just going to think about generalizing. But, but what I'm going to show you is that on one dimension, he does incredibly well. And on another dimension, he does incredibly badly. And I'm going to argue that it's not, it's not just chance that he did really well in one dimension and another dimension, but there's something about those two dimensions, one's quantity, one's price, that lends him to do really well on one and really badly on the other. Okay? And there, I think you're going to end up generalizing something. But, but obviously, if this guy, if this guy is terrible, then you don't know whether it's whether everybody's terrible or just this guy's terrible, right? But, but I think if you can, but as I'll, as I'll show you, there's certain elements he's, he's terrible on that I think probably everybody is pretty bad on too. Well, also I was just imagining if entrepreneurs are born, so some hit it 5% too low on price or quantity and some hit it 5% too high, they could all be terrible. It would still look like they're profit maximizing with some error, right? And this seems like a first step, it would be nice to know. Yeah, and, and one one thing about him as well is that I, I've observed his data for a long time, so I can see whether he's evolving over time. To it, right? So I can I can see whether he's getting better or worse, right? Which might also inform the question: Is are, are people just born good or bad, or do they actually learn what to do along the way? Okay, so what do you need to know to figure this? Out? So this is, well, the, did he deliver to the same companies every day? Uh, he delivered once a week to each company once a week. So he on, had the, on the same day. Uh, the same day of the week, the same company. So there's like Tuesday would be bagel day or some, some office party. But he had probably 200 customers in the country, like 40 or 50 customers a day. So what do I need to know if I want to estimate 
whether or not he's bringing the right number of bagels to donuts. There's like one key thing that you gotta gotta know to try to get at. That's the question. So I have that. So I, I mean, but what is it? But what am I missing? Like what? When he sits down at the beginning of the day and says, "How? Uh, why am I going to bring 12 bagels or 14 to some customer?" What's what's he got to be thinking about? How much money to open up? But but what what determines that? Well, what else? The demand curve, right? He needs to know the demand curve, okay? So you sit down and say, okay, this is a really simple problem, okay? But the only thing I need to know really is the joint distribution of the demand for bagels and donuts at some company whose initials I don't know what they stand for in some office park. And you have to, I don't, I don't even know how to start thinking about writing down the model to solve that, that Thing, right, so this is—I mean, this is what, this essentially what when you get to a point, you say, okay, so I need to make some assumptions about what those demand curves look like. Okay, but I don't even know how to begin to conceptualize what those demand curves look like, um, and that's where you kind of come to this fork in the road. Where you say, am I going to take a structural approach to this, or maybe I'm going to quit, or am I going to do something different? Okay, and uh, and I struggled. I tried to write down a structural model for about a week, and I just realized it didn't make any sense. And finally, I sat back and I said, well, what would a better economist than me do with this? Okay, and I thought about the kinds of things that I had learned from Kevin. I thought about the President Reed's paper. And I said, well, is there any empirical content that I have that doesn't require me knowing the demand curve? Okay, and it turns out there is. So what, what implication, if this guy is optimizing, what is an implication which is true, regardless of what the demand curve What's it got to be? What's got to be set equal to what? With every profit maximizing curve set equal to what? Marginal revenue margin. Right. So it got to be set marginal revenue margin cost. So I said, well, do I know? I know. I already told you I know it's marginal cost. So the question is, do I know it's marginal revenue? And the answer is, I do. You know, I basically I can observe the data. So more, you know. So let's just forget about that. He's got two products. You just say he's got one. He's just got one thing. Right, so so what's what's his problem? What, what does he have to? So he knows his marginal cost. He's got some cost. So at the morning, what is he? What's he trying to decide? What's his marginal revenue? Well, it's got some price, right? It's not marginal revenue in the demand curve sense. Right? It's, it's not like because we're not thinking about what we would normally define. But it is his marginal revenue. You're right. Yeah, it is. You're right. It is a little different because it's a. It's really in the stock out context instead. Exactly. Of, right. Okay. So yeah. So we'll put it another way. As he thinks about should he bring one more bagel, how much revenue is he generating from that 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 incremental bagel that he brings? Okay. Well, so he's got so so he's going to get the price. Okay. Now I actually got to throw in some other term, which is because guys cheap. So this is like just to how much the guy's cheat. So some guy steal his bagel. So you got to factor that in. So we got, this is some number less than one times the price. Okay. But a lot of times he's not going to get that. A lot of times he's going to go at the end of the day. He's going to have that bagel sitting there. Okay. So he's only going to get that times the probability that the last, the last bagel eat. All right. So that's how much if you bring one more bagel, it costs him that for sure. And then that's how much he generates. No, Steve. How do, you, how do you deal with different flavors of bagels? Kind of change this a little bit, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so I come in, there's no sesame left. Exactly. If you had another sesame, you would Exactly. Have. So yeah, every referee I've ever had has asked me how I deal with sesame versus plain. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and not in the data. So, I, so, so obviously, there's a little trick. So you can think about how, how you might deal with the sesame. That would be a pretty good approximation, even in that case, if you don't know which one to leave. Right, you don't you know what to think about. Yeah. That, right? You right. might want to think about how would this get adjusted in a world where there are different bagels, there are demands for different bagels, and there's some, and I don't know which one to leave, so I don't, you know. Right. Yeah. So, so I do think about that a little bit in the context of their bagels and donuts. Right. So now, if you bring two things, now, now you got to think about if I bring one more bagel, uh, it's possible that what's going to happen is that the guy who would have, you know, that I'm going to have lots of bagels. All the donuts uh, 
uh, all the donuts. I still have lots of bagels left over and lots of donuts left over. All right, then I bring one more bagel. Actually, you know, then you know you're not going to sell it. Ignoring the flavors problem. Exactly, right. So, so basically, you got to worry. So it turns out that his markup is much bigger on bagels and donuts. Okay, and so he does not want to bring one more donut and have that donut get eaten in place of a bag, right? So you can work out some more complicated points. But, but more or less, like, the whole intuition of this part of the paper, which is just easy to bring my mind, comes down to just rearrange this and saying, I observe everything except everything is known. Okay, so I observe this in the data. I can see whether they eat the last data, they eat the last um, bagel, okay? And so it just basically, Empirically, I look at this probability. Empirically, I know marginal cost. I know price. I know at least average state. I don't know the marginal state, but I can assume that if I assume the marginal is average, I go to the data and I see if that's true. And, and like this is, I mean, this is like totally obvious if you think about it using the right kind of simple tools of economic theory. But I kind of sitting on the couch for that first week trying to figure out how I'm going to answer this question. Wasn't that easy? For me, at least, to see that this is exactly where I should end up. Okay, but in the end, you did end up here, and, and you can look at some data and see what happens when you, when you do that. And and what happened? And I'll tell you what makes it so interesting is how incredibly good he is. Okay, so this might be too small to read, but here's here's uh, here's what happens. Okay, so I, I aggregate stuff to just look year by year. So just take a whole year's delivery, and I say on average, for starters, I say how, on average, how did he do? Okay, so you've got, you got here, uh, so the average posted price of the bagel and how it changed. It goes from 60, so take that top here, 60, 64.6% is the average posted price. The marginal cost of the bagel is 21 cents. The payment rate, that's how much guys steal from. So people only put in 92 cents for every dollar of his posted prices. The probability that all the bagels eaten is like 37%. And then I can compute the expected profit from that last bagel delivered. That's the thing in the box. Okay, so I compute that on the last bagel delivered, he earned 0.9 cents of profit on average from the last bagel. Making a few assumptions, I can also make I can also compute what his expected profit would have been was on the next to last bagel delivered. That one, that one I can do for sure. sure. And, then, and over here, I got to make some assumptions about what would have happened because I don't observe whether the, the next one. Uh, and then you can see that basically this is always going to be the, 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 the third to the last column is always going to be bigger than the, than the second to last and the last. You've got declining you know, lower chance of getting it eaten. And what it turns out is that every year this guy does pretty good. It's like according to my you know, two things. This is not this is how he does, but this is also a joint test of how I've written down the problem and how he does. So the fact that even, you know, unless I happen to write the problem down in just the wrong way that he made some mistake and my theory counteracted it, it's a pretty remarkable kind of. So these are a set of places he only delivers bagels. So this is only bagels, right? So he has a set he only delivers bagels, and he has a set he delivers bagels and donuts, and so then I can I apply that the same ideas to those, having estimated some kind of cannibal station. Okay, so, but basically, see, overall, it does incredibly well. And if you, uh, and uh, but I just want to point out one thing. It's not something that's just blind luck that it does incredibly well. Because you can see as his marginal cost moves around relative to the prices, he moves things in the right direction. Right? So he's got years where the probability of the last big elite is 47% versus years where it's only 30%. So it's not like he just has some rule of thumb which says, I want 39% you know, of my bagels to be eaten every year. He, he actually seems to be moving the stuff around in the right direction. As his as his marginal cost is moving up and down as relative to the So you're saying if I want to do a graph of like that probability on the left and the thing on the right, it would fit pretty well. Yes, that's what I'm claiming. I've never drawn a graph, but yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. If you draw it. That's a good idea. See, this is like giving a seminar. You get uh, you get good feedback. Give me that piece of paper. I'll draw the graph. <laughs> you want to draw the graph, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> I don't draw too quickly in case it looks bad. Do you, do you know what what information, if anything, he's taking out of this? Like what statistics he's 
So he, so he basically day by day, he day by day gets the, um, he gets the feedback on how many were left over, the, how many rust creeks and how many were left over. Okay, so he basically has continuous feedback about how things have been going. And more or less, you look at what he does, right? If they all got eaten the day before, he brings a few more. If they didn't get eaten, he brings a few less. I mean, that's more or less what he does. You also see he has better information than me, because every once in a while, you'll see he'll bring like seven dozen more donuts than he did the last time. It's obvious they're having some office party, they call it so they have a party, right? So, so when I actually try to go and estimate it, it's going to turn out, so uh, let me, I don't, I don't have to show you all these, but it turns out he's unbelievably good. Here's how good he is. So I, I spent about two weeks trying to program up an algorithm to help him predict better, and what I found is that I could make him about $100 a year in profit if he followed my algorithm. And I couldn't predict, I couldn't absolutely predict anything. And the only way I could add any value was to say, I know how many he's bringing now, so let me see if I can predict when he should have brought one more or one less or two more or two less. And that's where I could just, if, you know, I, I have a table in here where I show that basically I have a little bit of ability to do that. Right? So if I if I look the, at the cases where like where I think where I predicted that he would have the greatest shortfall, uh, then in fact he tends to have a short. Using only information available up until that moment of time. If I thought he didn't bring enough that day, it turns out that he's more likely. Um, it's more likely there's a like a 52% chance he's going to stock out, and then if the ones where I thought he brought too many, he only stocks out 25% of the time. Okay, so basically, there are a few cases where I could tell him to bring one more or one less, it adds up to $100 a year. Okay, but my consulting rate, the week I spent trying to do that was like an incredible, poor, incredibly poor investment. Right, so uh, it was not uh, it was not that uh, good. Okay, so did, you know without going any more into that. He is unbelievably good, like shock, to me, shockingly good at how he keeps his Okay, so let me show you how he does on prices. Okay, so as I said, he changed prices four times over the course of the, the 15 years of my sample. So you can see that, and on August 31st, 1993, he raised his price on bagels from 60 to 75 cents. August 4th, 1998, he raised the price from 75 to 85. Okay, so look at these numbers. And somebody tell me what, how I know that he is doing an awful job on pricing. Anybody see what the key numbers are there? Well, there are a couple key numbers, but some of them were. Just look at the first two columns. Look at the first two columns. Look at that one price change. What is in there that is just a telltale sign that as soon as you see this, you say, this guy is totally blowing it. Unless you got a more complicated model of price. It's profit. Okay, so that's obvious. What, what go, go look at it. So what else, how do I know his profits are gonna go away well, even if I didn't have that profit line? What happens to his revenue when he raise prices? What does that tell you? If you raise prices, your revenue goes up, what does that mean? Price on the elastic part of the mega. Is that a good idea in general? No, unless you got a more complicated view of the world, that is a really dumb thing to be doing, right? So uh, what you see is that in every single case, not so much at the end, so that's why he's pricing on the inelastic part of the demand curve, at least in the short run, right? So I've got to worry about short run versus long run. But, um, okay, but, but clearly, like he's doing, he, he looks like he's doing something very, very, Wrong here. And, and uh, every time he changes prices, his profits go. Talking about short run versus long run, that holds for at least a couple weeks after. Yeah, so I can show you. It doesn't hold for. It, it holds for a lot longer than a couple weeks. You can look up. So here I try and estimate. This is before and after. Uh, before and after. Uh, so so this is saying how what's his average daily profit? Six months, five months, four months, three months, two months, one month prior. To a price change, and then in the months after the price change. Okay, so what you see is that in the month prior to the price change, if you don't control, if you control for a sub jump, but uh, to control for year dummies, month dummies, daily week dummies, that in the month prior compared to the month after, his daily profits go up by like 67 bucks. Okay. If you look uh, now and you allow not just for changes to happen, one, not just comparing one month before and after, but one, two, and three months before and after, you see that in the three months beforehand, all these are negative, and, he, and, you have, 
and, and in the three months after, it continues even three months after to be earning $60 more than, okay, so the omitted category here is any month that's not within three months on either side of the price. Okay, so, so at least three months out, it's very clear that whatever was happening between the month before and the month after continues to happen for three months. Okay, when you go to six months, it gets a little less clear. You can see as you go out here to five months, six months, these numbers are getting smaller. Uh, standard errors are still pretty big. It's hard to know what's going on. So it might be that four, five, six months out, uh, there's some demand adjustment which is starting to undo the benefits. But, but nonetheless, you still see that he's a lot better off six months out than he was, uh, not statistically, but in terms of the point estimates, than he was in any of the preceding six months before. I mean, you've got to answer Question, but I mean, obviously, a, lot, a, a simple question that you know, people should be I think, asking is, you know, if I looked at supermarkets, their prices that they charge, and I looked at their price variation, it would look like they're not maximizing either, right? Because if they're raising their prices at the same time everybody else is raising their prices, then you're getting the market elasticity, not the not the not the firm elasticity, yeah. right? I mean, so that's obviously one question. That people yeah. But it's actually tell the people's why. Yeah, so one so what so so to get to that, so to answer those kind of questions, you've got to know why he was changing prices and what was it. And one of the nice things about doing research like this is that you just call the guy on the phone and you ask him and, and he has a pretty good memory about why he changed the four times the same price. Why? And what he would say so he basically said, you know, it has been seven years since I changed my prices, I decided I'd change my prices. So it doesn't look it doesn't look to me like he's like exactly changing prices because Dunkin' Donuts, you know, changed their prices the day he changed his prices. Okay? So I think it's, I mean, he does say, he, one of the times he said, well, I went by Dunkin' Donuts and I realized that the price of donuts had gone up a lot of Dunkin' Donuts, so I realized I could raise my prices as well. Uh, it wasn't like Dunkin' Donuts changed prices that day. It's like he no. just did good, but, but uh, so that's okay. So you said there's another point too, right, Kevin? So that was one point. Do you want to make another one? I mean, then the other question is, is, you know, is, is, is this really his constituency? Is, is this what he's maximizing against? Is there some other level of competition, like the you know, pricing kind of stuff? Yeah, or, the, or the guy, or the guy who runs the. He's going to find somebody else to deliver. Exactly. He's going to get rid of Bagel Day and he's going to have Hot Dog Day, and the Hot Dog <laughs> guy's going to bring him in. If he charges too much for bag. Exactly. Right. So all this. So the obvious thing to do is here say, is, is he making a mistake, or is he in some kind of it, dynamic pricing model? It'd be more surprising. For example, if his prices were too high, too high, that would seem to be more surprising because you think of lots of reasons why there would be other market forces that would be pushing his price down. It's hard to think, at least in my mind, cases where you'd say there's a lot of other market forces that are causing his prices. Right. You know, because it would seem like, boy, if, if he could make more money cutting his price. It only has benefits. It only has benefits. The employer is going to get more customers. Exactly. There's a zillion stories you can tell. Yeah. So from an economic point of view, it's not as surprising that it differs in this direction. It right. just opens a whole bunch of hypotheses that we would want to evaluate. But why is yeah. Right. So then the nice things you can ask them. You say, are you afraid of competitors? They laugh. So I've been doing this for 25 years now. I've never, I don't think about that at all because he thinks about competitors like Dunkin' Donuts, but he doesn't think about another guy coming to deliver bagels and donuts. He said, in 25 years, I haven't seen anyone else try to do it. Even if they did, you know, no reason they'd come to my office park. I've got 2% of the office park. What about, but does he think his price has any effect on the probability that he's going to keep a customer? Yeah, so what he, what he, his basic, so, so <coughs> the nice thing is, I mean, bring these results to him. But he, he probably said, knows this, right? No, he's he did not know it. <laughs> he did not seem to know it when I he, he didn't realize that he was more profitable. He made did more not. money. Than he if he did, he didn't understand the implications of it. I don't think he understood. It's funny because he looks at the data in certain ways. I don't think he had really uh, internalized. Now, because he, he don't see in like his total revenue, he got more money to put in the bank. He, he, he should have, sure, <laughs> but, but but he was surprised. I think he was surprised when he saw my result. And um, and uh, and his, his theory was. His theory about prices, I told him, you know, so if you just take, take a, like a very crude model, linear model of demand, and extrapolate out of this, you think his prices should be like a dollar ten for a donut or something like that. Okay, so I said, why don't you try it? Okay, and, and in, in the model he had in his mind, 
is that there was a highly nonlinear domain, and that there was some threshold, some tipping point, and if you went above that, all his demand would evaporate at once. And I said, so how often, you know, you think that might vary across different places, and how often in the past, when you raise prices, how often do you see that happen? He said, I've never seen it happen. It's kind of interesting that he had this model that had zero period of 11. So I said, well, why don't you do an experiment? And uh, I said, every time you get a new customer, um, he didn't want to experiment on his existing customer, that's fine. So every time you get a new customer, flip a coin, if it comes up heads, you give your price. If it comes up tails, uh, give them my price. My prices were not rated. My price is, and he wouldn't do it. He said, I, I can't afford to do that because it's too risky. Because uh, it's so hard to get a new customer. It's so hard to work with a new customer. I can't afford the risk of charging your prices and having them not buy anything. And I said, the real risk you can't afford is to be charging the wrong price for the next 20 years like you charged for the last 20 years. Because you've got 400 customers. If you charge 10 of them the wrong price, there's not actually any risk. Right? You, you lose a few hundred bucks over some time period. But the real risk uh, is, is that you just never give any feedback. Right? And that's the problem. That's the difference between price and quantity. He got feedback day after day after day about whether he was charging the right quantities. And on price, he only changed it four times. It's really hard to know if you're charging the right price if you're only, charge, if you're only changing the prices four times. And it's obvious you should be doing more experimentation. But, but the, fact that even after, the fact that even after I told him it, he refused to experiment or change prices, kind of made me update too on that he, he you know, could just be he's embarrassed. I mean, that was part of it. He's embarrassed to be wrong. Um, and he didn't want to, I think there's some cognitive distance. He didn't want to admit that he was pricing wrong for 20 years. But you might also mean that he thinks that, you know, I've got the wrong model. Right model. Okay. Did he ever cut anyone off because either their demand was too variable or their rates of payment were too low? Uh, so a couple times. So the only, the, the too variable wasn't a problem because you could always just bring fewer, fewer bags of donuts to, to truncate that up. He, he said a couple times, he said there were telemarketing firms where like nobody paid, where people just stole all of the donuts and their pockets. But that was like two out of Two out of five hundred customers that you'd ever actually cut off. Does it look bad, Jesse? Does that look good or bad? It's all right. I just wonder. Um, That's it. I just wonder if he was worried maybe about um, you know if you if you um, have a low price and then you raise it, then you might piss people off and then they'll never come back. Whereas if you start like if you start with a, a too high price, then they're not interested. In Yeah. Some kind of reference point that yeah. No, I think that's possible. Sure. But that's why I said don't even don't even mess with like. I mean, the key to all this, the key to experimentation in general, is if you do it on a small part of your pool, you just can't lose it. All right. So if you experiment with a new way of getting ideas, it takes ten minutes a day. There's no risk to your career as an academic because the most it's ever going to cost you is ten minutes a day, right? If you suddenly change everything you do. Say that from now on, I'm going to go invest in like a huge course in Tony Robbins, and I'm going to spend all my time acting like Tony Robbins. Then that is a big risk, right? So, so I think this is a case where, for like in your own life or in your business, that little experiments are are, are a really good idea. Okay, so I got just ten minutes left. I want to I want to put up without really talking in much detail. I want to show you two other examples. So that this is the about that here. That was a paper that essentially had almost no identity. Right? That was a paper that had two old less regressions, and it had something like a natural experiment in that he changed prices four times, but almost nothing to it. What was the, the only reason this can exist is the paper is that I went out and got a different kind of data and thought to answer questions people weren't answering. Okay? If, people, if people had done a thousand studies of profit maximization with good data, I couldn't have done a paper like this. It's a paper where the threshold is pretty low for, for shedding some insight because no one's really doing it. So what if you, what if you, um, so, so an airline approached me and they told me that they uh, had no idea whether they were charging the right prices. And they wanted me, they, they asked me if I could figure out whether they charge the right prices. What, how could you figure that out? Without experimenting? With Without experimenting, just using their historical data. Don't they have algorithms? Yeah, it turns, out they, it turns out this particular airline had this black box algorithm that they had no idea. They didn't really have any idea whether they charged. Their, their basic rule for setting prices was 
they sent a bunch of college grads out every day to look at what their competitors were charging and whatever their competitors charging, they charged the same thing. <laughs> Except that about four times a year they had a big sale. Here's how they did their big sale. They just looked at how many miles they had to fly. Like, so if the flight was like 249 miles or you know, 700 miles, whatever. And they basically, like this, so it's maybe $99 if you flew 249, you know, 0 to 249. And it was like $199 if it was 250 to like, you know, 499, What if you saw this? Does that give you any ideas about how you might be able to figure out whether they're charging the right prices? What's that? Make it continuous. Yeah, no, the view, so why is this, why is this perfect? Why is this an unbelievably stupid thing to do with your business unless you're trying to figure out why is it hard in general to figure out whether people are charging the right price? It relates exactly what Kevin was talking about today. Because what do you observe? What do we observe in the real world? Do we observe demand curves? We observe equilibria, right? Right? And if they're any good at all, they're moving around with their prices to reflect demand conditions. Okay? But this is great because every other day of the year, they're charging virtually the same price for a $249 a mile uh, flight and a 250 mile flight. And then for no good reason, almost at random, they radically change the prices of these two virtually identical products. And that's how it, what you want to estimate in a demand curve, is you want to see the same product sell for radically different prices. And so, um, it actually was kind of embarrassing because I just got done telling them how if they were good at their job, there was no way I was ever going to be able to use their historical data to figure out who has this is man. And then like two seconds later, they told us how they did the fair sales. And I said, oh my God, that's perfect. We'll be able to tell you, we we're really going to be able to answer the question. And then one guy turned to the other and said, well, I'm glad we're so bad at our job. It <laughs> <laughs> turns out not that easy once you got this to answer it anyway. It's a hard problem because, because, um, for like a million reasons. Like one is that although they advertise the sale price is only about 10% of the tickets that actually sell fit the, the restrictions of the sale prices. And so um, you, gotta, you gotta think about cannibalization. Are people moving from uh, the higher price tickets to the lower one? And you also got this dynamic component where people might fly at the same time that they shift the point at which they buy the ticket or don't buy the ticket. But, um, but instead, well, I'll just tell you the results about going into it. If you just look, basically right here versus here and ignore those others just talked about, it looks like um, the elasticity of demand is like negative four, negative five. Which I think is not, given the marginal cost, I, I think they, they shouldn't be lowering prices, right? I mean, they should, be or they should, not. They should not be lowering prices, I don't think. Because this is ignoring cannibalization. Like, we're just getting started on this fight, but this is ignoring cannibalization. And they're, they're, selling, they're selling more of these tickets and, and less of the expensive ones. Um, well, this is the last system of demand for total tickets? Or? Yeah, no, for this particular kind of tickets. Seems like they, were, they, they should be jacked price though, right? Well, depends on why they're running these sales at different prices of tickets. I mean, that's a good understanding. Right, but, so, but partly I'm trying to get rid of that by saying it's, it is a low demand period in general. That's why they're running these sales. But it's not a particularly low demand period for $249 tickets for $250. Oh, you're just saying this is this is the optimal price. This is, there's no like I'm running sales for because I'm trying to price discriminate to get the guys who are willing to move and uh, travel and all kinds of other stuff. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So it's complicated, right? So I'm just trying to yeah. So it's 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 uh it's hard to do. So this is the case of a project that we're just getting started on. We know we have interesting data, and as we get deeper into it, every time we think, every time we turn a corner, we realize there's more and more and more complications about what you can. Of an exercise. So one of the things we're trying to do is convince them to actually also run some true randomized experiments. Like so, uh, but anyway, so this is like a so this is a, a natural experiment approach to to uh, the pricing that's um, kind of interesting. Let me let me take. I will go over five five minutes. I want to talk about one other paper that uh, that John and I have been working on. John Lister and I. 
And this is a, a company, you might have heard of them, they're called um, uh, People to People, and they send kids to Europe and to Australia on summer trips. They charge like enormous amounts of money. They, you must have gotten letters from them. They send out, when you were in high school, you must have gotten letters because they send out about 10 million letters a year to, to people like you. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you grew up in America, you definitely got their letters in the mail. Uh, and they have succeeded. They're incredibly profitable. And they have succeeded by doing experimentation. They've, they've honed direct mail, the letter they send, to like an art form where they grew up. Okay, but they've never, despite the fact they've done maybe a thousand experiments in the firm, they had never done experiments on price. Okay, it's a good example about how people like get in a way of thinking. They thought it clearly was the right thing to do an experiment with like how, what typeface they had on the letter, but nobody ever thought to do an experiment on price. We were able to convince them to do an experiment on price. But before we did it, we wanted to have some idea about whether the prices were going to be too low or too high. Right? And so we thought, is there any kind of natural experiment in the data that would lead us to it? And they've never experimented with prices. They basically raised their prices with inflation every time. Okay? But it turned out that there was a good natural experiment hidden in their data. And that is that every time you take, buy one of these, 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 these trips, it's priced like they do with a cruise. Okay? So they have a base price which says, once you get to Los Angeles, uh, we charge you this much for the trip. And then there was a cost to get from Portland, Oregon to Los Angeles, or Portland, Maine to Los Angeles. Okay. All the Australian trips started from Los Angeles, all the European trips started from New York. Okay. So what it turns out is that if you live in Portland, Maine, it's pretty cheap to fly to New York. It's really expensive to fly to Los Angeles. You face a higher price for the Australia trip than you do for the New York trip. Okay. But if you live in Portland, Oregon, it's cheap to get to Los Angeles, it's the opposite. So you do end up having price variation. Okay, but it's all based on geography. It's not necessarily the best variation you'd ever hope to have, but it's something. Okay? So we went into the data, and the elasticity of demand that we estimated from this existing data was, um, was, uh, was zero. Okay? That just, we saw no systematic relationship between the cost of getting from wherever you live to the, to, to the, the departure city um, with demand. Okay? So who knows what that means? But, but probably not right, but, but that's why you've got to go do the experiment, right? But at least when you do the experiment, it says, well, if I'm going to experiment with prices, I'm going to experiment by raising prices rather than lower prices. Okay. That's what we did. And it turns out, we, we went, so then we went and we did experiments. They randomized experiments on 700,000 people, uh, one of the largest randomized experiments, field experiments probably ever done. And it turned out that we raised prices either 5 or 10 percent for a bunch of people. And the, um, and the elasticity of demand we, we got when we raised prices by 5 or 10% was like 0.5. So they were happy. So we made them a lot of money because we raised their prices and demand turned out to be pretty inelastic. We made them a bunch of money. So the next year, it turned out that a lot of bad things happened. Okay, that, um, uh, it was 2008, so you had the financial crisis, uh, you had um, uh, you had uh, currencies were moving the wrong way, you had high oil prices, which kills them, and the Attorney General from Iowa told them that their letter of Iowa was like so misleading that they were going to get sued if they didn't change it. Okay? So they had a lot of things changed at once. Okay? Because of all these other things, they decided to mark up the price about 10%. On top of that, we convinced them to do another experiment where they raised them an additional 5%, an additional 10%, where they lowered them 5%. Okay? Okay. So the results come back. And their overall sales are down 40%. Okay. And they get on the conference call with the investors. And um, they basically say, look, we worked with these guys who were telling us the price high, and they totally blew it, and they made, and we raised our prices too high, and there's nothing wrong with our basic model of the good we're providing. It's just because of bad advice, we raised our prices. Okay. And, we, and they totally scapegoated us, made, us, made it all seem like it was our fault. Okay? The beauty was we had done these experiments with a 5, a 10, and a 5% price reduction. Okay? And we could see that um, the data came back. And it turns out that the last issue we got this, this year was like 1.3. Okay? And so, so we had the data. Like we could go back and say, look, you can stay and go outside you want publicly. But you, all I'm saying is if you had to deduct your prices where they were, you would be doing even worse than you are doing. You'd be selling a few more drips, but you'd be profit-wise doing even worse than you're doing. Um, and they were smart enough to understand that and, uh, and to, to raise their prices again this year. Um, 
despite the fact that they publicly uh, were, were saying that we were the, 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 the blame for, for everything they had done. So let me stop there. This is some examples. So, so, that, so there's a case where you, you combine. I think it's a good, a good model for papers is to combine existing historical data with experimental techniques to both get an idea of what experiment to run, and then also as a way of checking what do the results you get from the experimental, how well they match the results you got from the historical, and if they don't match, why? And what do we learn about that? And you can get some people fired. What's that? And you can get some people fired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, good. So I guess Kevin and I are talking to folks right now, right? And yeah. you want to do it in our office? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you guys know where the, where you have somewhere on the sheet what the office numbers are? So I'm at 370. Yes. Bye.